good morning everyone uh, i'm going to talk about uh, bleeding per rectum it's a per rectum with loss of vein uh, at any point if you have questions you can put them on the chat <coughs> uh, or ask me at the end uh, so when you talk about symptom analysis there are a few very crucial things that you need to uh, ask a patient whenever they come and tell you that they have had bleeding so First thing is obvious, it's the question you ask from anybody, how long have you had this bleeding? What's the duration of this bleed? Uh, could be several days, could be several years, but remember in anybody who's had bleeding for years and years, say for example from hemorrhoids, they can always develop a second pathology like a malignancy, which is a cause of bleeding right now. They, are both, they can both be fresh bleeding, but there is nothing to say that just because they've had bleeding for years and years, it is the same, lead, same problem now. Uh, so if they fulfill the criteria for evaluation, they should have that, even if they've had uh, bleeding for years. Next question you need to ask is the type of bleeding. And we're trying to differentiate fresh or bright red blood from altered or dark red blood. Uh, why this is important, this, this fresh versus altered is a very simple uh, uh, feature that we're trying to differentiate. If you're going to seeing fresh blood, bright red blood, that is blood that has just left a vessel versus altered blood, which has been out of a vessel for some time. This is all that it says. There is nothing else that this type, this feature tells you. But we use this to get an idea about where it has bled. If you're seeing fresh blood, it is generally a location that is close to the anal canal because you're seeing the blood as soon as it has left the blood vessel. So you're thinking of a left colonic lesion, most likely a sigmoid or a rectal lesion. Altered blood, on the other hand, has been out of a vessel for a while. So you can assume it to be more proximal. Uh, there is always a caveat to this. Blood works as a laxative. So it increases intestinal peristalsis. So if there is a massive bleed, even more proximal, you may see a bleed, you may see that blood coming sooner or you if you have a massive bleed even more proximal it may come as a fresh bleed uh, next we talk about clots why why do we ask about clots for somebody to develop clots the bleeding uh, there are a few things that need to happen a the blood can't mix with stool so it is generally if you're seeing clots it is generally place in the colon where stool is already solid. So you're thinking a left colonic lesion or a rectal lesion uh, or that part of bowel has got to be empty at the time of bleeding, no stool. Generally doesn't happen with right-sided lesions. Uh, often it is a left-sided lesion. And of course, the relationship of the bleeding to stool. Uh, the blood could be independent of stool, meaning the patient goes to the toilet, passes blood, but does not pass stool. It could be separate from the stool. They pass blood at the time of defecation, but stool passes separately and the blood maybe is coating the stool or bleeds separately. Or the blood could be mixed with stool. Basically, you see blood inside stool. Again, this is an, gives an idea of where the bleeding has happened. For the blood to be mixed with stool, at the, time, at the point of bleeding, the stool needs to be liquid or soft where the blood can mix. So you're thinking a more proximal or a right-sided lesion. If the blood is separate from stool, but they're still bleeding, that means the stool is already solid by the time, of, by the time blood enters the colon, indicating a more distal or a left sided lesion or blood could be independent of the stool. Uh, for blood to be independent of the stool, it needs to come 
in an area where there is no stool. So very often if you get blood independent of stool, it is generally a rectosigmoid or a sigma, uh, rectosigmoid or a rectal bleeder because often the rectum is empty. Remember, rectum does not store stool. That is a job of a sigmoid colon. Rectum gets filled up only when you're about to go to the toilet. So the rectum is often empty. Uh, and for you to get only blood, that is what you need. If you ask all of this uh, and, and get answers to this question, you can fairly well identify the possible location of the bleed. So the other things you need to ask in a patient that comes in this are associated symptoms. So you ask about alteration of bile habits because it can be a lesion uh, that can give rise to both these problems, bleeding as well as alteration of bowel habits. Tenismus, which is a painful desire to defecate, uh, it is defined as a painful, fruitless desire to defecate. You get pain in the perineum when you need to go to the toilet. You go to the toilet, but you pass nothing. So that is tenismus. Then the sensation of incomplete emptying. You go to the toilet. You pass something, you come back and still feel like you haven't passed anything. Obviously, we will ask about appetite and weight loss. Because it's a bleeding problem, we can ask about other bleeding manifestations. And since one possibility is malignancy, and only about 5% of malignant malignancies are familial, you still ask about a family history of malignancy. Uh, a few things about tenismus and incomplete emptying. Remember, tenismus, like I said, is a painful, fruitless desire to defecate. This happens because of the involvement of the neural plexus, our barks and myceness. If it's a malignancy that is causing this, it is going to be a, at least a T3 tumor because you need something that is invading beyond submucosa into the muscularis propria. So if you're thinking malignancy and if a patient has tenismus, then you're very sure that it is not an early tube. Sensation of incomplete emptying, for example, in contrast is because there is a mass lesion that the rectum perceives as a lump of stool. So you could, the patient goes to the toilet, passes stool, empties all the stool, but because this mass remains in the rectum, the rectum still feels that there's something there. So you're not going to get this with a tiny polyp. For somebody to get a sense of incomplete emptying, they need to have a fairly large mass in their rectum. Uh, talking about tenismus, tenismus can happen in inflammatory diseases like ulcerative proctitis or Crohn's proctitis, but this again, needs to involve the neural plexus. So just mucosal inflammation will not give rise to this. If somebody is with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's complaints of tenesmus, you know the inflammation is now involving the muscularis. On examination, you would, on general examination, you look for pallor and features of anemia because the patient has had bleeding. You'd look for weight loss because several conditions of the colon that can give rise to bleeding can cause weight loss. And then you do an abdominal examination, a digital examination, and a proctoscopy. Those are mandatory parts of clinical examination in a patient that comes with bleeding. Now that I've told you the basic assessment of uh, a patient with bleeding, let's move into the cases. So patient number one is a 50-year-old male coming with a five-day history of passing fresh blood for anus. So some people will come up, come out and say they're presenting a plan with all these details. Some won't. Some need many, many questions to get the information that you need. So 50-year-old male, five-day history, fresh blood coming out. And when you ask direct questions, they tell you that there are no clots, no alteration of bowel habits, there is no pain and no weight loss. What you do next 
examine the patient. Do general examination. He's well looking. He's not pale. He's only there for five days. Do an abdominal examination, which is normal. Do a digital examination, and that is also normal. So what do you do next? You turn him back and say there's nothing wrong. No, you do a proctoscopy because hemorrhoids, unless they are fourth degree prolapsed hemorrhoids, are not going to be palpable on digital examination. Remember, these are venous cushions, uh, just dilated veins in the submucosa of the anal canal. The moment you put your finger, these veins collapse. So you're not going to feel anything unless one of them is thrombosed. So you need to do a proctoscopy for you to see hemorrhoids. And every doctor should be able to do a proctoscopy uh, if they are going to deal, if they're going to be first contact doctors. Uh, so the only way for you to see hemorrhoids is by this. The moment you remove the obturator of the proctoscope, you will see hemorrhoids collapsing inside. Once you've identified hemorrhoids, you can also grade them. So grade one, is hemorrhoids that don't come out of the rectum often find found because it's bleeding uh, and when the doctor examines because the patient will not feel a lump it's inside the anal canal uh, trade two will are the hemorrhoids that come out at defecation but goes back in spontaneously grade three does not go back in spontaneously so the patient needs to reduce and grade four will not go back in even if the patient tries. This classification is important because this is what determines the management of hemorrhoids. Grade one, all the ones that are inside and not coming out can be managed with sclerotherapy. You inject a sclerosant uh, and the hemorrhoid shrinks. The sclerosants we commonly use, uh, what we commonly use is 5% phenol in almond oil or olive oil and you inject each hemorrhoid mass and it shrinks in a few weeks. Grade two, the ones that come out and go back in spontaneously can be banded. We apply rubber bands. Uh, how this work is the rubber bands constrict the hemorrhoid, uh, constrict the blood supply to the hemorrhoids and the mass eventually shrinks and falls off due to ischemia. This happens somewhere between seven and 10 days. And at that point, the patient may experience the bleeding. So you always forewarn the patient that this can happen. This works in another way. When the hemorrhoid falls off and there is necrosis, there is also fibrosis subsequently, which uh, binds the mucosa to deeper tissue. So it works as a hemorrhoidal pexy to stabilize the mucosa. Because this sloughs off and causes bleeding later, we cannot use this in patients who are on antiplatelets. So if somebody is on clopidogrel, it is unsafe to do a banding because the patients may end up with a bleed when the hemorrhoid falls down. Grade three and four hemorrhoids are classical hemorrhoids that require hemorrhoidectomy. What is practiced commonly is a Milligan-Morgan procedure or open hemorrhoidectomy. Uh, so large hemorrhoids like grades three and four require that. There are also novel options for hemorrhoid treatment like laser or Doppler guided ligation. The main problem with these are they're expensive. They require novel devices, which are expensive, which adds a per patient or a recurrent expenditure. Uh, the advantage of these are some of them are comparable in terms of outcomes for uh, these and uh, so re reduced pain is uh, the main advantage but the problem is the cost if you're unable to decide what to do just refer them to the nearest uh, surgeon uh, there are surgeons in most hospitals so all of you should be able to easily refer a patient to a surgeon uh, there is a question in the chat about a fissure which i will talk about when i get to fissure 
So thank you for your question, but uh, it's coming up in the next few slides. Uh, and remember the hemorrhoidectomy pain is not often not as bad as both the patient and the doctor thinks it is. Uh, so many patients of mine have very little pain if you manage them with proper surgical technique and post-operative analgesia, most of them will have very little pain. Remember, hemorrhoids may be the commonest cause of bleeding with, without any other symptom, but there can also be other lesions causing bleeding like cancer or polyps, fissures, vistulae, and anal warts. So just because somebody has hemorrhoids or had hemorrhoids previously, doesn't mean that their current episode is due to that. By, the, by sheer prevalence, hemorrhoids can coexist with other pathology. And there are some unfortunate patients who can, for example, have a fissure and hemorrhoids at the same time, just because hemorrhoids are common. Okay. Patient number two is a 30-year-old female complaining of passing bright red blood and defecation for two days. So 30-year-old female, bright red blood, two days. She was constipated for the last five days, also complains of painful defecation. There were no clots, so no weight loss. So what do we do next? You examine, you do a general examination. She is well, being has only been there for two days. Abdominal examination, it's normal. What do we do next? Remember I told you, you need to, your components of examination are general abdominal, DRE and proctoscopy. What do you do next? You do not do a DRE. If you do a DRE, this is what's going to happen to you. Patient is in a lateral decubitus position and the patient is going to kick back straight at you if you try to do a DRE. So you do a gentle perineal examination and you will see a fissure. It's, you don't need anything else. If you're gentle and gently part the uh, skin around the anus on either side, you will see this fissure. You may see a sentinel tag, not essential, but you definitely will see this fissure if you do that. And you, uh, the answer to the previous question that came in the chat, you do not do a DRE or a proctoscopy because it is too painful in an acute fissure. How do we manage acute fissures? First of all, most of these are due to constipation, often acute constipation. So you manage them with a laxative, either lactulose or cremaphene. Avoid lactulose in patients with diabetes because it's a sugar. So you can try cremaphene. Uh, the second thing is analgesia. It is an extremely painful condition. So the patient needs analgesia, both topical and systemic. Topical analgesia, what, you, what I use is lignocaine. Uh, takes 10 minutes to work. So they need to put it 10 minutes before they go to the toilet. And you need to advise them that they need to apply it in the anal canal, not, uh, not the perianal skin. Also, systemic uh, analgesia, NSAIDs and paracetamol. Why a fissure doesn't heal is because the spasm of the internal sphincter uh, causes ischemia, reducing the healing. So we need to relax the anal sphincter. What is commonly used, what, is, what I commonly use is 2% DLTSM called Diltafis, which, you, which the patient applies three times a day and that relieves the spasm which helps with healing if the patient is compliant with this conservative management in six weeks time almost 80 percent of them will heal so you don't need to do anything else for 80 percent what about topical gtn i don't prescribe gtn it causes horrible headache patients often come and say the headache is worse than the anal pain so only shifting the pain from the bottom to the top. So I don't use GTN. I don't think anybody should use GTN. Uh, and that headache is 
by nature of how nitrates behave. So there is no way of getting around that headache. So BLTSM works well enough. If you try this for six weeks, most will settle. Uh, there are two questions coming in the chat. Uh, characteristics of pain in anal fissure and tenesmus. So tenesmus is a perineal or a deep pelvic pain that happens before going to the toilet. You get a painful, fruitless desire to defecate. It's the desire. Uh, fissure pain is pain at defecation. Until they go and the fissure gets opened up, there is no pain. So it's fairly obvious in terms of timing what the difference is. Etiology of anal fissures is due to constipation. That's why it's very commonly 6 o'clock, occasionally 12 o'clock. When the patient passes a hard bolus of stool uh, by virtue of the angle of the rectum and the anal canal, that bolus presses against the posterior wall of the anal canal and tears it. So that is how people get uh, fissures due to constipation, which is the commonest cause. Uh, Rarely you can get patients getting recurrent fissures due to Crohn's and other problems, but common is constipation. Now, I said it, most of these will heal in six weeks. If it doesn't heal in six weeks, one main option is to give Botox injection, botulinum toxin, which paralyzes the internal sphincter for six weeks, uh, for, for six months, total of six months, but often the big action or the most strong action is for a few weeks. Uh, and that is long enough for the fissure to heal. All you need is about four weeks for the fissure to heal. So the duration of Botox is fine. The problem with Botox is it's very expensive. Uh, so if the patient can afford, that's the best form of treatment you can give. Historically, and even now, people used to do internal sphincterotomies, the division of the lower part of the anal sphincter. It works well because there is no spasm thereon and fissures heal. I do not do this the first line for anybody, and I almost never do this in young females. And I'll tell you why. Uh, remember, a fissure is a temporary problem. It settles in a month. You don't want a permanent solution for a temporary problem. And why this problem is permanent is because of this. Now, this is some data that uh, came about 10 years ago from our unit. Uh, first time that uh, it, the Asian anal sphincter was studied. So this is what the anal sphincter looks like. It is not a cylinder. It is very narrow. Or it's a short segment. Ideally. And this segment is even shorter in females. Now, why this is a problem is that if you do a lateral sphincterotomy at 3 o'clock and cut the bottom end of the sphincter, by start circle, basically taking out that white area and the only sphincter bit that is actually functional in the internal sphincter is the one in top, that narrow purple band. So if the patient has an ultra short segment or ultra short sphincter, which is not uncommon among Asian and Sri Lankan females, you're going to render them incontinent, if not now, when they hit menopause. So you have to be very careful when you do internal sphincterotomies. Uh, so I personally don't do internal sphincterotomies or lateral sphincterotomies for females. Uh, males have a slightly longer sphincter than females, so we can afford to do a short lateral sphincterotomy, but you have to be very careful when you do this. Remember, fissures are not the only painful conditions. You can also have fistulae often with abscesses that are painful. The commonest painful condition or the second commonest painful condition that I see are perianal hematomas, what historically were called external hemorrhoids or from external hemorrhoids. These are perianal hematomas. These are hematomas under the perianal skin or the anal canal. Nothing to do with the hemorrhoid. Again, passing a bolus of hard stool, 
damaged vein, caused a bleeding, and the hematoma is there. You don't need to do anything. You need to drain it. It settles spontaneously in about three weeks' time. All you need to do is give them a laxative uh, for two to three weeks, metronidazole to prevent an infection for about a week, and if it's acutely painful and affects uh, defecation, you can give <coughs> a lignocaine to be applied before going to the toilet. That's all you need. You don't need to drain it or aspirate it. Most of the time, things get infected due to our intervention, then leaving them alone. Moving on to patient number three. This is a 65 year old uh, complaining of passing blood for two weeks. So, 65 year old male, bleeding per rectum, two weeks, passes clots. He was also constipated for the last three months. He has sensation of incomplete emptying and tenesmus. Anybody coming over the age of 50 maybe with bleeding, you should, that by itself is a red flag sign. You should be worried. In addition, this man has several other problems. He's constipated for the last three months. He has sensation of incomplete emptying and he has tenesmus. So all of these things should tell you that this man needs further investigation. You do a general examination, there's a bit of loss of weight. You do an abdominal examination, it is slightly distended, there's fullness in the left lower quadrant. You do a digital rectal examination, there is a mass, in the rectum, seven centimeters from the anal verge, and there is blood on the examining finger. And you do a proctoscopy, and you will see if it's a low rectal tumor like this, you will see this tumor. Okay, so what do you do next? You refer the patient to a surgeon. If you're not in a surgical clinic and if you don't have the expertise to manage a patient like this, the first thing to do or the most important thing to do is to refer them to a surgical clinic. It is very important that they are not lost to follow up. Remember, we don't have a national screening program. So there is no way that a patient can be identified or an asymptomatic patient can be identified with early disease. When somebody comes, we've already lost that window of opportunity to catch them early. So we now call them at a fairly advanced stage, meaning, I mean, I don't mean advanced in that sense, but it is nevertheless advanced. So you need to make sure they get referred to a surgeon and they don't get they they're not lost to follow up. Uh, the main reason why people are worried about going to a surgical clinic the moment you tell them that they have a problem with the colon is they're worried about a stoma or a colostomy. The first thing you must say is that not everybody with a colon cancer needs a colostomy. So don't worry about a stoma. You also need to be aware of the investigations uh, done for patients with a rectal cancer because some patients might ask, some might come to you with the reports they have before they meet their surgeon. So these are broadly how we investigate. You do tests to get a definitive diagnosis, to stage, do other cancer-related things, and of course, fitness for surgery and anesthesia. Definitive diagnosis is through a colonoscopy and biopsy. It is always a full colonoscopy. We, even if it's a rectal lesion, we do a full colonoscopy because we want to see the rest of the colon. There can always be coexistent polyps. 3% or more will have this. 
So you need to do that. Next is to stage the disease. So staging, you do a contrast enhanced CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, chest to look for lung mats, abdomen to look for liver mats and other colon features and pelvis, look at the pelvis or the rectum, local spread. Since this is a rectal cancer, you also request an MRI pelvis because you want to see uh, the mesorectal fascia, which cannot be seen on CT. You do an MRI to look for mesorectal fascia, which, whether it's invaded or not, and lymph nodes in the mesorectal fascia, uh, which are prognostic indicators. In a patient with cold rectal cancer, they also require carcinium chronic antigen or CEA. And eventually, uh, most of these patients will require surgery because for almost all patients in Sri Lanka, the definitive management of colorectal cancer is surgery. So to assess their fitness to, for anesthesia and surgery, they will need an ECG, an echo, and where facilities are available, cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPEX. You also need to know about the preparation for colonoscopy. This patient may come and ask you. And a colonoscopy is only good if the patient has had proper preparation. If not, you're not going to see much. Obviously, there need to be written consent. Then bowel preparation. The standard bowel prep we use is polyethylene glycol. Commercial preparation is called teen prep. There are different regimes. You can have a split regime where the patient takes two sachets the day before and two on the morning of the procedure, or you can give it back to back four sachets. The most important thing is they drink all four properly and they drink liquids in between. It's not a pleasant thing to do, but it is essential that they do this. Otherwise, we can't see much. Uh, colonoscopy is performed under sedation. Sedation by midazolam and pain relief by pethidine. Uh, patients are often vague but unaware of their surroundings uh, and not in pain very often. Uh, incomplete colonoscopy is a possibility worldwide. So not being able to reach the cecum or the terminal ileum is always a potential problem. Uh, in that case, the options are either a colonoscopy on a different day, a double contrast barium enema, or a CT virtual colonoscopy. All these options are available in Sri Lanka. Uh, expertise may not be widespread, but these options are available. Contrast in NCT is the contrast we use is iodine based. Uh, we look at uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, like I said earlier, we're looking for the tumor, where the tumor is, what size it is, whether it's infiltrating surrounding organs, whether there is metastasis to liver, lung, vertebrae. And if it's a colonic lesion that is causing obstruction, there will be changes due to that as well. Uh, we also look, uh, when you're ordering uh, contrast in NCT, you must also be aware of side effects and complications. There can always be allergic reactions to the contrast medium used. That doesn't mean they can't have CT, just that we need to take certain precautions to see that is one. Second, of course, is about the radiation exposure looking at about equivalent of about 400 chest degrees. And of course, the potential nephrotoxicity of iron-based contrast media. If somebody has impaired renal functions or potentially at risk of developing AKI, you need to take a few steps in preparing them for their CT. If you're unsure about this, just ask the radiology team 
they will advise you. This is a patient, uh, this is a CT of a patient, where you can see the thickening of the colon here. It is also invading the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, and that, for example, is what you would see in a colonic, uh, a CT, if you were to look at a colonic malignancy. This is what uh, liver meds look like. The normal is white, like this. Uh, this is a portal venous space. And these are metastatic lesions. Remember, the two thirds of liver perfusion comes from the portal vein, only one third from the hepatic artery. So, if you look at the liver in the portal venous space, that is where the liver is brightest or white. Whereas metastases get their blood supply from the arteries. So, in the portal venous space, metastases are poorly highlighted or they're darker than the rest of the liver. Okay. Very briefly, treatment, the definitive treatment is going to be surgery. There is an option of non-operative treatment for rectal cancer with definitive radiotherapy, not widespread. It may come into the glands later, but not yet. Patients will require chemotherapy or require therapy. Rectal cancer will also require new adjuvant therapy or therapy before. Patients may require a temporary stoma. Hardly anybody requires a permanent stoma unless they go unless they undergo a, a abdominal perineal resection they will not require a, store, a, temp, a permanent stone. Follow-up is for five years. If your occurrence is free for five years, you're considered cured. Initial two years are more frequent and the interval becomes prolonged in the next three years. The components of follow-up include clinical, colonoscopy, CT, and carcinomembranic antigen. Moving on to patient number four. This is a 24 year old female complaining of passage of altered blood with stool for four months. She also has diarrhea and weight loss of 10 kilos over three months. 24 year old female, altered blood, four months with diarrhea, weight loss, poor appetite, colic abdominal pain. Anybody, especially young, coming with prolonged abdominal, prolonged bleeding, abdominal pain, weight loss, think of an organic problem. There is bound to be a problem and they require uh, the abdomen, the abdomen is scaphoid because they've lost some weight. There's tenderness in the right uh, right low quadrant. You do a digital rectal examination. There is erythematous skin and fistula. Remember, 40% of patients with Crohn's disease will at one point or the other have perianal changes. In 25% of patients with Crohn's, they will present with perianal problems. So what you see as the first episode of a fistula or a fissure or an abscess, maybe a patient with Crohn's. If you're thinking of Crohn's, the diagnosis requires colonoscopy and segmental biopsy. We need a definitive diagnosis and the only way of doing that is with a colonoscopy. And we need segmental biopsies because we need to assess the extent of disease. Remember, Crohn's can affect mouth to ends, any part of the GI tract and extent can happen a colonic involvement so we need to assess the extent 
Fecal calprotectin is a very useful test. Uh, it helps in the diagnosis where diag the diagnosis is not clear. It also helps to assess the response to treatment. It is available in Sri Lanka. Uh, you can't get a keto in most places. It is a qualitative test. They tell you whether it's positive or negative, but it's a very useful test. If you want to look at small bowel, uh, you need an MRI enterocolysis. Basically, it's a special MRI scan that looks at the small bowel, ball thickening, which we cannot do with other tests. Things like capsule endoscopy are not first line because you always have the risk of capsule retention if there's a stricture. So you prefer to do an MRI enterocolysis first. Uh, there are a few questions coming in the chat, which I will take at the end. Treatment of Crohn's is very simple. Uh, it is like uh, putting the giraffe inside the fridge. You achieve remission and you maintain remission. Those are your principles of management. How you do that depends on the extent of the disease. Achieving remission can be through steroids, immunomodulators like azathioprine, or biological therapy like infliximab. Maintenance of remission is not through steroids because of the side effects. It is through azathioprine or infliximab or similar medication. Surgery is generally con uh, limited to stricturing disease or in patients who have poor response to medical management. Surgery is not first line to, uh, for uh, IBD. Remember, there are other causes of bleeding uh, per rectum. Uh, which I have not discussed so far, fistula in ANO, diabetic disease, rectal prolapse, polyps, etc. Uh, so I've only discussed four, but there can be other problems. If you're unsure, just refer them to the nearest surgical clinic. In summary, you need to do a proper symptom analysis, identify red flag symptoms, Identify potential risk factors from the history and do an examination, which includes general examination, abdominal examination, a rectal examination or DRE, and a proctoscopy. And your investigations are endoscopy, which can be flexisig or uh, colonoscopy depending on what the indication is, imaging like CMRI and biomedical tests like FECA-TEPIN or CA. Uh, that brings me to my presentation. Uh, there are a few questions that came in the chat. Uh, what is the colorectal cancer screening currently practiced in Sri Lanka? Very easy, we don't have any screening. There is no national screening program. We have what is called an opportunistic screening program. So if somebody comes to me with bleeding per rectum for whatever reason, we recommend a colonoscopy or flexing or some form of investigations to identify that is appropriate for his level of risk. Obviously, not everybody that comes with a problem will require endoscopy. But if we catch somebody above the aid of the Western guidelines recommending investigation, we would do that. But nationally, we don't have. There is no fecal local blood testing or endoscopy program nationally implemented in Sri Lanka. Uh, next question is how to differentiate simple fistula or Crohn's. Generally, uh, if somebody is having recurrent fistulae, you would suspect Crohn's. Uh, sorry, just... Yes, so how do you differentiate Crohn's and uh, recurrent fistulae? When we do surgery, 
if it's recurrent or if we suspect the uh, possibility of Crohn's, we would send uh, tissue for histology. And if you see non-caseating granuloma in that tissue, that is how you know that this is Crohn's. Also, if somebody comes with the classical perineum I described, erythema, multiple fistulae abscesses, abnormal fissures in different locations, then we suspect Crohn's. Uh, what is the difference between hemorrhoidectomy and staple hemorrhoidectomy? Well, both are surgical procedures. Open hemorrhoidectomy does not use devices like a stapling machine, a staple gun. Staple hemorrhoidectomy is a specific technique using a spe specific device, which can be used for mainly third degree hemorrhoids uh, to remove them. So both, they both are surgical techniques. Uh, the difference is one uses a stap uh, hemorrhoid stapler, the other does not. What is the natural history of polyposis coli? If you are thinking FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, the normal variant, they start developing polyps in their teens and one of them will most likely get malignant in their 20s or 30s. If you are thinking of an attenuated polyposis, attenuation may be less polyps, or less aggressive disease. Uh, it's difficult to give a direct answer because there is a huge variation in the genetics of what happens and when it happens depend on the actual mutation they have. But if you suspect polyposis, they require evaluation and we unfortunately don't do genetic testing to the level of identifying the genes to advise them exactly what problem is. But if you identify them with polyposis, generally they will have a total colectomy around the age of after 18, when they are old enough to decide for themselves that they want to go through surgery. The ones you see coming with malignancy are the ones that have been missed. Those are the new mutations. Remember, FAP is autosomal dominant. So if one of the parents had it, the children will have it. So they, they are caught by screening. What you see coming malignancy are the ones that are new mutations. Uh, when to start and stop antiplatelets for hemor uh, banding for hemorrhoids? Okay. Aspirin, you don't need to stop. The problem comes with uh, clopidogrel. The decision for, so as far as banding is concerned, they need to be off clopidogrel for seven days and you don't start it at least for another seven days. Now that is from my point as a point of view as a surgeon. But whether you can stop it or not depends on their risk, why they were started. Now, for example, if it was PTCA, the drug eluding stent, you cannot stop clopidogrel for six months minimum. Beyond six months, it depends on the risk benefit. Uh, so stopping depends on the, the indication that it was started for. Best ask the cardiologist why it was start, who started it. As far as the banding is concerned, I need at least one week of clopping free before and one week after. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions in the chat. Uh, are there any more questions? Um, so I think that's the end of the session, sir. That's all the okay. questions we have today. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of, uh, I think there's one more question, sir, that just ah, came yes, up uh, on the If there is a family history of cancer of colon, what is is the screening test we need to undergo. So remember, familial colonic cancer is just 5% of all colon cancer. So just because somebody has a family history doesn't mean that they have a special screening test. So they need a colonoscopy five years before the age of diagnosis of the first degree relative, not some distant cousin. So it has to be a first degree relative. And you would do a colonoscopy five years before the age of diagnosis of that family member. And that's what they need, unless that, that family member had a polyposis type cancer, in which case the polypo management applies. Uh, this is about a sporadic uh, colorectal cancer. Okay, I think that's the end of questions, and that's.
all from me. Yes, I think that's all for today, sir. On behalf of the Society for Health Research and Innovation and um, all our members and participants who participated very actively today, I would uh, like to give my sincere thanks to Professor Dakshita Vikrama Singha, Professor in Surgery and Consultant Surgeon attached to the University Surgical Unit of the National Hospital of Sri Lanka for this excellent and very informative lecture and for spending his precious time on this Sunday morning to deliver this lecture to us. On behalf of Sri participants, thank you very much uh, for joining us again. We have posted a link for the e-certificate. Please uh, fill it now or within 20 minutes following this lecture so that we can register you to receive the e-certificate within this coming week. Thank you again all for joining us today and we hope you will join us again next week, Sunday, same time for another webinar on another timely and interesting topic. Thank you and have a nice day.